Okay, I'm really freaking out about this, and I have no way to get my message out to enough people. Please don't take this lightly, and stay safe. This is what happened to me two nights ago. I was encouraged to share this with you, because I was told you've had people with these same experiences, and you can help them. I recently moved into a condo in southeast Portland. Where I'm at, there's more houses and condos than there are apartment complexes. I was out on my balcony smoking a cigarette when I noticed something strange. Now, before we get started, I will say this. I have heard of black-eyed kids, children, people, whatever. I don't usually get spooked by scary stories or creepypastas. They're all fun and games, right? No harm. Yes, I have had weird things happen to me that I can't explain. Don't get me wrong. My boyfriend swears I was possessed once and had an object thrown at me when I was in a basement alone. Paranormal weirdness that I don't bother much to try and understand. I dismiss it. I go on with my life. I never believed I'd be writing something like this. I'm a graduate student on a professional track and I stay pretty firmly grounded in scientific and reasonable explanations. Whether I know what they are or not, I favor the belief that they're the underlying cause of everything. Okay, on to my story. I'm on my balcony having a cigarette. Across the condo complex on a neighbor's balcony, I see two silhouettes. It's late, around 2 a.m., and it's a weeknight. One was slightly taller than the other, but they both look to be female and around the ages of 8 to 12, with one of them being just a bit older. I saw movement, and the two stood close to one another. I could hear them knocking on the second-story balcony door. My light was off, so aside from my cigarette burning, I don't think anyone could see me well enough to know I was there. And once I saw them, I was frozen still. I don't know why, but as soon as I could make out their shapes, I felt an overwhelming sense of terror, like something imminent and dangerous was preying on me, and I couldn't move. After some time, maybe ten minutes of paralyzing fear and listening to their knocks, the light in the condo came on, and someone opened their blinds. I was afraid for them. I wanted to yell to the neighbor to stop, but I was more afraid they'd see me, and I can't explain it, but I knew I didn't want them to know I was watching. The neighbor stepped back, I think, probably confused and apprehensive. I could understand why. I heard the voice of the taller one, and it's burned into my mind. It was completely accentless and seemed to be void of any life or cheer. Like a kid is usually happy. Even if they're not happy, they sound happy. But this was so weird. I knew it wasn't the voice of a child or even a person. It wasn't human. Something in this voice was wrong. I couldn't hear exactly what she was saying, but at one point, the smaller one turned around and stared straight at me like she knew I was there the whole time. I wanted to piss myself. Still paralyzed with fear, I couldn't move. I saw pale skin and huge black eyes. It was dark, it was far but I know what I saw. When she turned around, the light from the balcony lit up her face, and I could see well enough to know that her eyes were pitch black. And her clothes, they were weird too. Old, outdated. And the little girl was expressionless. The neighbor had only opened the door an inch or two, and looked like she was ready to slam it shut. The taller of the two girls became angry and she seemed as though she was going to make her way through the damn door. The neighbor slammed it shut and locked it hard. I could hear the fear of that woman with the intensity in which she locked the door. She stepped back from the door, leaving the blinds drawn, and I lost sight of her. They stood, and then the smaller one looked up at the taller one. They looked at each other. They said nothing. No communication, and in unison, they looked towards me. Finally, I broke free of my paralysis and bolted inside and locked the door, still holding my cigarette with its filter burning at this point. 
I kept the light off and kept my eyes on their shadowy silhouettes. This is where it gets crazy sounding, and I search desperately for a way to say this that anyone that's reading can comprehend the sheer shock, terror, and seriousness at what I witnessed with my own two eyes. They dematerialized. No joke. I mean, they just turned into an almost swarm of what could have been insects and disappeared, swear to God, on my life. I watched the spot where they'd been standing for what had to be the longest 60 seconds or so of my life. And I stepped back away from the window in fear of them popping up behind me or something. I was shaking violently and my cat rubbed on my leg meowing in some kind of attempt to console me because he sensed my fear. I noticed my cigarette filter still in my hands and it was flattened from me pinching it so hard. I looked down at Milo, my cat, and back outside because I wanted to try to find them. I looked where they were on the porch to see if I'd gone insane temporarily and that they were just hiding there or something, but they were gone. My neighbor returned to where I could see her in the window. She was on the phone, probably to the police, and that's when I noticed them again, directly above her, on the frigging roof, just standing above her, holding hands, and they got down on their hands and knees. I was still completely gripped by fear and horrified by what I was seeing. Backtrack a little bit. Since we moved in, we've been hearing things on the roof at night, running back and forth, like footsteps, dropping something heavy, which is weird because we're on the second floor and it's the top floor. We've been arguing with the neighbors who said we're making too much noise during the quiet hours of 10.30 to 6 a.m., which we definitely don't. I'm always asleep due to medical school, and my boyfriend stays up late, but he's always by himself. We don't have a TV, so he just reads or goes on the internet. He doesn't stomp around or move furniture, so I always thought it was weird that it sounds like people are walking above us or running or whatever, but I just chalk it up to trees hitting the roof and whatnot. So anyway, these sons of bitches are on the roof somehow. Don't know how they could have even gotten up there. And they get on their hands and knees and are moving on top of this lady's roof. It looks like they may have been scratching at it or digging at it. But I could see their black eyes in contrast to their skin, with their heads cranked up straight watching me through the window of my balcony door. They were both looking right at me, which was extremely unnerving. I don't know what the hell happened, or why. I knew I had to get some kind of proof of what was happening, but I was terrified to take my eyes off them and lose them from view. I knew my phone was plugged into the charger in the kitchen, and something in my head said to me, not in my own voice, don't move. You may not like where you see me next. Like someone was talking to me in my own mind. It scared me so much, I felt like my heart was going to explode. I wished someone was there other than my cat, so I could validate what I saw, ask them to bring me my phone so I didn't lose sight of them. But I had to take my eyes off them. I had to chance them vanishing. My phone's important. It would prove that I wasn't crazy. I broke our staring match and ran into the kitchen. Just breaking the gaze eased a bit of the terror, but I was still shaking. I grabbed my phone and I went back to the window. They stood up in unison. I pulled up my camera and snapped a picture. But the frigging flash reflected on the window, and it turned out to be a shitty, nothing picture. But even then, I think it upset them. I was trying to take a picture, and they didn't like that. And they started to disappear again. Like I said earlier, dematerializing or something. Because you could see, like, pieces of them all fading sporadically, lessening into them, not being there at all. What in the hell? I stayed looking at the roof, the balconies, even down below, and I couldn't see anything or anyone. My neighbor was still on the phone at the door. Her husband, or significant other, or some male roommate was there with her, and she was pointing up and talking to either him or whoever was on the other end of the phone. She pointed outside and stomped her foot. 
He was shaking his head in what seemed like disbelief. And she passed him the phone and left my line of sight into her condo. I wanted to go out on the balcony, but I was still so afraid. I felt wrong, sick to my stomach from the intensity of what I experienced. I told my boyfriend all about it when he came home, and he was very freaked out. He's never seen me get upset to literal tears about anything and knows I'm a diehard skeptic of aliens, ghosts, and anything paranormal. I dismiss every photo, every video. They're all hoaxes to me. And I just think with everything anyone can do with technology nowadays, there has to be a reasonable explanation. Not for this shit. I'm sorry, but people don't just freaking dematerialize and rematerialize. They don't. We aren't there yet, and I don't think we will be for a long ass time. So what the hell did I see? Anyway, it shook me to my core, and I wish this is where the story ends. But it doesn't. The very next night, I was smoking on my balcony again. This was last night. It was earlier than before, and this time, my boyfriend was home. I felt creeped out, but okay enough to go out with him within Scream's reach, so I was going to have a quick cigarette before bed. I was in a robe and slippers, and this time, I turned my light on. I sat down and lit my cigarette with the balcony door still open. I took a long drag and exhaled and heard two coughs somewhere above me. Holy shit. I knew exactly what it was. I froze, and a deep sense of dread boiled up just like the night before. I threw my cigarette down and almost tripped over the sliding glass door. I locked it immediately, at which point my cat began to freak out because he hates being locked up, and he followed me outside. He was going bananas. He was screaming pathetically and frantically. I gave in and opened the door. He bolted inside and I slid it closed and locked it again. I kept the light on and called my boyfriend over. They're on the frigging roof, I said, and we both got quiet. We both heard footsteps above us, and his eyes got big. We stood there silent and just listening. They sounded like they were heading towards our front door. I ran over to it and double locked it using the top lock, which we always leave open. As soon as I touched it, I felt this cold, creeping, depressing sadness come over me, like a wave. And then there it was. Knock, knock, knock. They were waiting for me to open the door. I tried to muster up the courage to yell who it is, and it came out more like, who's there? Timid, and way less courageous sounding than I would have liked. That voice from the prior night, that dead, lifeless voice, was being directed at me. Ma'am, you have to let us in. Please help us. Hell no. I didn't say anything. I wish my door had a peephole, but it doesn't. So I started backing away. Knock, knock, knock. My boyfriend came up behind me and gave me his phone. He said, We have to get a picture, or no one will believe this shit. It was no more than a whisper in my ear. I shook my head, knowing he was right, and started to approach the door again, hoping to sneak a photo through the high window to the right of the door. When I was just a few steps away, the taller one lifted her face up to that damn window and shook her head in a disapproving no. The blinds were mostly down, but I could see her face almost entirely, with the exception of her lips and chin. Those big black eyes with absolutely no sclera anywhere. Holy shit, they were huge. Like, too big to be human eyes. And there was no way she could reach my window. She had to be floating there to look in, which made me even more confused and even more terrified. I had my camera up and ready to snap the picture without flash. And then when I looked, she wasn't in it. I'm serious. She should have been. I snapped it while she was there. She was still there after I took the picture, but she wasn't in the goddamn picture. I looked back at her soulless, creepy-ass face, and she somehow smiled without smiling 
Like, haha, you can't prove this happened. I almost wanted to open the door and be like, what the hell are you? And that's when it happened again. And my boyfriend saw it too this time. She just slowly fell apart into nothingness and vanished. The heaviness I was feeling lifted, and my boyfriend and I were like, what in the hell is going on? He asked if we should open the door and look, and I was like, just hold on a fucking second. He asked if I got the picture. I gave him the phone to see for himself. He was like, no way. What the hell? Why is she not in the picture? I don't know what they are, but there's a reason no pictures of them exist. They're real, but they can't be photographed. Does that mean they exist in another dimension? Or are they dead? Or vampires? I don't know. I would never believe anyone if I heard my story from anyone else. If it didn't happen directly to me, there'd be no way I'd give it the time of day. But it did happen to me, and I'm really scared. I'm scared it's going to keep happening, or worse. What do I do? I'm just so grateful to be alive, but the terror I felt around these girls really has me on edge. I'm so scared of going out to my balcony, or even leaving my house at night, or going to my house at night. It doesn't feel safe anymore, and I have no way to legitimize what happened, or do anything about it. I want answers. I want to know what they are. I want to ask them if I see them again, but it's like I can't even speak around them. I'm just almost completely immobilized. How does someone combat something like this? It's like something from a Stephen King novel, but it's actually freaking happening. I feel like they're really pissed off, especially since I tried to take pictures of them. I don't know what's going to happen next, if anything. But I had to get it out somehow, because it's real. It does exist, and it's changed everything I ever thought about the paranormal. It's so scary. I hope they don't ever come back, but I know from hearing these things at night, they may be here more often than I'd like to believe. And whether I see them or not, they're there, and I have no way to prove it. It's just so frustrating and soul-shaking anyone that can help I would appreciate it does anyone have answers or advice what are they what do they want has this happened to anyone else or anything similar thank you this is not my story to tell it's my brother's but he's no longer with us so he's unable to tell it for himself. At the time of his encounter, he was 45 years old, and it took place in Santa Fe. I didn't hear about this story until a few months after it happened, but the way my brother told me, I know he wasn't making it up, and it's something I'll never forget. He maintained that what he witnessed was true up until the last time we got to speak. His first encounter happened at his home at about 7 p.m. He was a lifelong bachelor, but successful in his own right. One night, he was just watching TV, and he heard a knock at the door. He opened it to find a small boy on his porch. He said that boy couldn't have been any older than 10 years old, and was dressed really strange, like his clothes didn't fit because they were too big. And they were old and plain looking. A blue faded shirt, baggy black pants and dirty sneakers. My brother figured it was just a neighborhood kid, since there was a bunch of families in the neighborhood. He thought the clothes might have just been hand-me-downs. And then the boy asked to come in so he could call his parents, and my brother didn't think anything of it. All he saw was a little child in need of help and told him he could come in. While my brother told me this part, I could see this look of fear and regret in his eyes. He told me he should have never been that naive. And I kept thinking to myself, what could he possibly be talking about? All he did was let a child in to use the phone. But then as he continued his story, I realized that it could have been something completely different than what I thought originally. As the boy entered the house, he touched my brother's hand and thanked him. Up until that point, 
He hadn't had a good look at this kid's face, but when he looked up, my brother saw his eyes. He said they were the blackest black he'd ever seen. No life in them. No soul. He described them just like demon eyes from the show Supernatural. Or like a shark. Once he saw the eyes, he immediately started getting nauseous and dizzy, to an extreme point. He told the boy he had to leave because this overwhelming fear started to grip him. The boy nodded, not even asking for the phone again, and walked out of the door. After that, my brother said he had to lie down because he felt so nauseous and disoriented. He was in a cold sweat from the fear that he was feeling from seeing those eyes. And he ended up sleeping for almost 12 hours straight. After that is when he started having problems with his health. I want to stress to you and everybody listening that he was perfectly healthy before this encounter. It started when he would get these weak spells. He'd get dizzy really often and started looking really pale, to the point where I would even make a comment about how pale he was. He'd get to the doctor and they'd run blood work. His white blood cells were elevated and he was anemic. The doctors weren't too concerned yet and started talking about taking iron supplements or some shit like that to help with the anemia. Later, he admitted to me that he'd always had a horrible stench that he would get whiffs of after he had that encounter. He described it like sulfur or rotten eggs or rotten meat or decay. He said he wouldn't always smell the smells, but he'd usually be able to smell it on and off throughout the day and get different whiffs of these horrible smells. He'd search his house for food that had gone rotten, or a dead mouse or some other kind of animal that was rotting, but he would never find anything that could be the cause of the smell. He passed it off that there was something in the house that was rotten. He started to smell it outside of his home, too. Maybe there was something in the wall, but he could never tell. Then soon after that, he was diagnosed with a staph infection in his elbow. And ironically, it was the same arm that the child touched. You can pass that off as a coincidence, but I chose not to believe so after seeing what happened to him. I believe he ended up being diagnosed with MRSA, which is a pretty bad infection that resists antibiotics as far as I know. He also ended up having a couple surgeries on that arm, once to drain it because it was so swollen, and the other time to cut away dead flesh. At that point, they actually discussed amputation as a treatment for his infection because it was so bad. His white blood cell count continued to climb, and his fever was enough to have him hospitalized with IV fluids. He was there for nine days before he was able to go home, and that was the first time he was hospitalized. I spent a lot of time with him after that, terrified I was going to lose my big brother. We lost both of our parents to cancer in the years past, and since he was never married, I was the only family he had left. My own kids were 8 and 12 at the time, and even though I wanted them to visit as much as they could, I also didn't want them to see how sickly my brother had become. He was always so weak and frail after that. He would tire out so easily and sleep so much. It was like he could barely walk to the kitchen or the bathroom without getting winded and then have to lie down and he would look even paler. I was heartbroken to see him like that. Not only was he my big brother, he was my best friend. I think he knew that it was taking a toll on me too because he always tried to be so upbeat when any of us were around. It was like he didn't care how sick he felt. His priority was comforting us. And then it was a month to the day from when he was released that he called me one night, on the verge of being hysterical. He saw the black-eyed child again. He was asleep on the couch and had woken up for some unknown reason and that kid was standing over him. Listening to my brother tell me this, I for one could tell he was telling me the truth because I could hear the fear in his voice, something I'm definitely not used to. And two, I don't think it was a dream because if it was, it was the most vivid dream anybody had ever had. As wild and unbelievable as it sounded, my brother was being visited and tormented by some kind of unearthly creature. The child, or whatever it was, told him it would be okay. But my brother, from fear or exhaustion, I'm not sure which, 
passed out again once he saw this creature. When he woke up, that kid was gone. And like I said, he was positive it wasn't a dream. As far as it saying that it would be okay, it was never okay. My brother ended up staying with us after that, until he was readmitted to the hospital again. He'd had another fever and another infection of unknown origin. This time he was hospitalized for two weeks. Over the course of one year, he was hospitalized four times. This is including the two I already mentioned. He ended up having everything from infections in his kidneys to transfusions because he was so anemic. The staph infection came back in his elbow and then spread downwards and he lost control of his hand for weeks. Every time I visited him in the hospital, he looked worse and worse. And I mean, I visited him every single day. He didn't look right. Sometimes he'd be gray because he was anemic, and other times he'd be almost yellow because of his liver. The doctors couldn't figure out the source of what was attacking his body. It was during the third hospitalization where he had his first transfusion. He saw that damn thing again. This time, it was standing at the door of his hospital room. He told me, all three times he saw this thing, he was always wearing the same clothes. That old looking pale faded blue shirt and those baggy black pants, along with those dirty sneakers. This time, whatever it was taking the guise of a child didn't say anything. He just stood there and stared for a moment before walking off. But my brother was too sick to follow it. When I talked with him the next day, he swore up and down on his life that being touched by that black-eyed kid was the reason he was so sick to begin with. As much as I didn't want to believe it, as much of a skeptic as I was about anything paranormal, I started doing research. If modern technology and modern science couldn't figure out what was going on with my brother, then maybe there was some other route that I needed to investigate and I sure as hell wasn't going to give up on him. If you're listening to this, you know why you're here. You want to hear about the Black Eyed Kids, and I'm sure you know what I found out. They can't come in unless they're invited. They're always young, and if they are invited in, you get deathly sick. And of course, those black void eyes. At this point, my brother was finally released and he moved in with us. He was too sick to work. He couldn't afford to make payments because the medical bills were draining him dry. I told him I believed him. I showed him what I found. He read through it and just looked defeated, like he knew that he was never going to bounce back from this. And he never really recovered this time. He only got weaker and weaker, and I swear he started smelling like sulfur and decay. And then the fourth time he went into the hospital, he didn't come back. At this point, his organs were shutting down. His fever wouldn't break. His white blood cell count just kept rising. He slipped into a coma and a few days later, he was gone. My heart was broken. I was devastated, to say the least. I told my wife everything that he had told me about his encounters. She knew as well as I did that my brother was not one to make things up. She wasn't sure what to think or believe, and I'm still not sure she does actually. But she knows he wasn't lying. She just doesn't know what to make of it. I found a letter that he had written me after he was released the third time. And I really considered adding it to this email so it could be shared, but I chose not to. Part of it said he wanted me to explain everything that he had witnessed to our friends and family. We had some cousins out in California that we tried to keep in touch with, and I did my best to explain it to them, but I really think they think I'm nuts. Michael and Anthony Doherty, if you're listening to this, Brian was not nuts or hallucinating. I really believe this happened. At first, the black eyed kid phenomenon was something that sounded completely made up. But trust me, having seen what they can do 
and what they're capable of firsthand, I don't think it's a myth anymore. I've tried to listen to everything on them that I can, and the more I hear about them, the less made up it sounds. I truly, truly believe that you're safe from them if you decline their request to come in. My only wish is that my big brother, my best friend, would have known before he invited that little boy in what was going to happen. Thank you so much for getting Brian's story heard. Sincerely, Kevin Matthews. This happened to me in Vernal, Utah, when I was 17 years old. My name is Ethan, and I had an encounter with something I can't explain. I was pulling into my driveway after work, minding my own business, when these two young kids came up to me. They looked like they were about 12 and 10. One of them was a couple inches taller than the other. They were both boys. These boys looked like they came out of nowhere right as I pulled into the driveway, and they were wearing jeans and white t-shirts. One was wearing a black sweatshirt, and the other one had a red sweatshirt, but the clothes looked faded and old. They started asking me if they could have a ride, but from the very beginning of seeing them, I felt nervous and scared of them, like my body was telling me to get away and not to trust them. They just made me feel like something was wrong with them. So I lied. I told them my car was having problems and I needed my dad to look at it before I could drive it again. The shorter one did most of the talking, and said where they were going wasn't too far and the car would be fine. The other kid nodded to agree with him, but it was this weird, slow nod and honestly, it creeped me out even more. I declined again. I told them it still needed to be looked at before I could drive it again. Then the shorter one asked if they could use my cell phone. Now that day, I actually didn't have my cell phone, so I couldn't let them use it, even if I wanted to. Even if my body wasn't screaming, get the hell away from these things. I told them I didn't have it. They asked if they could use the house phone. These two kids, or whatever they were, just seemed to be very pushy, like their goal was to get to me, or to get inside. And they weren't very polite either, just short and blunt, like they were trying to convince me to let them in. One of them looked up at that point, and I saw his eyes. We're talking pure black, just the same way everybody else describes them, like a shark or an alien. I jumped back in my seat and just stared at them. Then the other one looked up too, and his eyes were the same exact way the other ones were. There wasn't anything in their eyes. No soul, no humanity, nothing at all. And I think they knew how terrified I was, and I think they liked it, because they started to grin. The shorter one asked if they could use the house phone again, if they could go inside, or if I could go inside and get it. I told them I could get it, but they couldn't come in. Well, I have to use the bathroom. Let us in. It was still the shorter one. Why he did most of the talking, I don't know. At this point, they started to seem like they were getting angry, and they were very demanding. They were basically telling me I needed to let them in, and every time I told them no, they got more and more aggressive. I told them they had to leave, that they weren't welcome here, but they went back to asking to use the phone. Come on, let us in, we need to use the phone. And then the other one started talking too. Yeah, let us in to use the phone. We need to use the bathroom too. They just kept arguing. Just the same excuses over and over and over, like that's the only thing they knew. The only reasons that they would think that they could get into the house. And then, I had the idea of honking into my horn to get my dad's attention. I wanted to let him know that I needed help. I laid on the horn. I kept pressing it over and over and over, letting it blast long and loud, and telling these evil kids to go away, that they weren't welcome here. I was so scared I was sweating and my heart was racing. I've never been that scared in my entire life. They said they really needed to use the phone, but I yelled at them to get away from me and that my dad was coming out with his gun. They turned and casually walked off after thanking me anyways and then they walked down the street. I started honking more and more. I wasn't getting out of the car without any kind of backup. 
and my dad and brother finally came out of the house. At that point, I flew out of the car and ran to them, telling them what happened to me and which way the kids went. I told them everything I saw, even the eyes, and my dad ran back into the house to actually grab his gun. When he came back outside, he jumped in my car with my brother and they took off down the street to find these kids. Needless to say, they didn't find anything, or even any sign of those kids. It was like they just disappeared, which maybe they do have the power to do. For weeks after that, I had nightmares. Nightmares about them trying to get into the house, trying to get to me or my family. I refused to be alone outside. My friend that I told my encounter to said he thinks they need an invitation based off what I told him. I agree. I think he's right. Reading and listening to every other encounter that I could find, it all seems to be the same. They can't come in unless they're invited. I'm not sure what these black eyed kids are or what they want, but I do know there's something evil about them, and I don't ever want to run into them again. Way back in the early 1990s, I'd gone out late one night to hang out with some friends of mine at various clubs in DuPont Circle. We were club hopping for a bit and trying to find out where the real fun was going to be. But due to myself getting older, I was getting really tired out and I finally gave up on the night and decided I wasn't as young as I once was. I told my friends goodnight and began to walk back home. I only had a few blocks from where I was going so I figured a nice quiet walk would be enjoyable. Besides, it would take me back past DuPont Circle Fountain and that's a location that I really enjoy. I got to the fountain around 5 a.m. or so, and there's not a soul around me. All's well, and the fountain was just spitting water and dribbling it down the sides. I sat there for a moment, playing with the water and just enjoying the night and how quiet it was, but that's when things started to get weird. Because all of a sudden, there's this kid standing about five feet from where I was sitting along the fountain. I mean, where the hell did this kid even come from? I sure as hell didn't see him anywhere in the park, so this kid was either one world-class ninja or he just ghosted up on the spot from wherever ninjas go and come from. He scared the hell out of me, I told him. The kid just stood there staring at me at first. The surprise of being snuck up on was still on me, but as it wore off I began to notice some odd things about this kid, besides the fact that he just appeared out of nowhere. For starters, he was only like eight or nine years old, and skinny and small, and wearing clothes from like the late 1800s. We're talking times from when kids wore hard to lace up boots every day because sneakers haven't even been invented yet. The clothes were really, really old, and so was the toy that he was holding in his hands. It looked like one of those old-fashioned sailboats that was probably popular around the time that his clothes were popular. The shorts were black, the shoes were black too and the skin on his legs was this extreme contrast because he was chalk white. I finally noticed his face and his eyes, and that's when this deep wave of terror hit me. His eyes were like black marbles or black orbs in the face of this young child. I have no idea why I was so scared of this little kid, but it was to the point where I was stammering and glued to the spot. Then this freaky little bastard asked me a question. Hey mister. Will you help me with my boat? Now, because of the eyes of this thing that was staring right into me, I have to admit, I was terrified at this moment. I know I was looking at this tiny little kid, but believe me, whatever it was was only taking the form of that tiny little kid. Because whatever it was that was behind those black eyes was something more sinister than you can ever imagine. I finally got my nerve and my feet and I backed away. And all this kid did was continue to stare at me with those eyes. Those eyes that just reminded me of a shark. Cold and dead looking. But they still seemed to convey this cruel intelligence and a hunger that might never be satisfied. I felt like this kid, or whatever the hell it was, had been digging into my soul with that evil, fearful vibe that it was giving off. I felt like it was emanating from this thing or something. Just pure fear and undiluted evil. This thing was definitely predatory and I shudder to think what it wanted from me. I shouted at it to stay away from me and its brow furrowed. 
I tried to walk as fast as I could out of there. I didn't know what was coming next, and I didn't want to know. I looked back, and what I saw made me burst into a full run. There were five more of those children standing on either side of this kid, like some unearthly, unbelievable, hilariously evil pack of wolves. And I looked at the first kid, and he'd gone all black, like Vanta Black. I couldn't see him at all, and I just ran. In the few seconds time it took me to walk away from this kid and then turn around to see if he'd begun to follow me, more of whatever these creatures were popped out of the same void that that kid came from. Now I don't know if that black I was seeing was the void, or if they have abilities to turn into a shadow or something like that, but I've never seen anything like that before. I don't know what these things are, but I know they're not human. They're abominations and they're anything but human. I hope I never have to face one of them again because I think they like to run in packs. When I got home, I locked all the doors and stayed up until the sun came up, which thankfully wasn't too long since it was already so late at night. It still gives me anxiety to go out at night, especially if I'm walking around alone. I don't need another one of these creatures popping up out of nowhere and trying to take me to wherever it dwells. I can't imagine that place is fun. I can't imagine what it wants to do to us. I got the distinct impression that if I had succumbed to its request to help him with the boat, I wouldn't be here telling you that story. I fully believe there's some kind of supernatural predatory species that likes to harvest us. For what? I don't know. Maybe it's to eat. Maybe it's to replicate. I don't know. I'm glad I never found out either. And I pray that nobody else does. Thank you for listening and sharing this story. Let me preface this by saying I'm by no means a writer, just a good old fashioned domestic engineer living in North Texas. Also, I don't believe in the paranormal. Ghosts, demons, aliens, whatever. However, I did have an event happen to me this Halloween that I have to admit has me scratching my head. I first posted this on Reddit, and now it's getting its way to you. I'm sorry to say that I've never heard about these things. I told my best friend about my incident, and she's an avid reader of No Sleep. She told me if I didn't post it, she would. So here I am. Anyway. I hope everybody would like this story, and I'm curious to hear what you have to say about it. So it had been a slow trick-or-treat night in our neighborhood that evening, which is pretty odd in itself. We usually have kids from different areas dropped off in ours and have a constant parade at our door. That night, I'd say we had no more than 8 or 10 groups of kids come by the entire night. It was about 9.30 p.m., and my husband and I were sitting in our family room watching some of those ghost shows based on, supposedly, actual events. Like I said, I don't believe in that stuff, but I do like a good ghost story now and then, and it was Halloween after all. I hadn't had any activity at the door in over half an hour, and it was getting late, so we decided to let the porch light turn off and let our dog Chloe out of her crate. She's an American bulldog, and very docile. We only put her in a crate because we were afraid she'd try and get out to play with all the kids and I didn't want to have to chase her down the street. Also, I didn't want her freaking out any of the younger kids that might be afraid of dogs. So I turned out the outside light and let Chloe out and she followed me back to the couch and laid down at my feet. Now it was getting close to 10 o'clock when my husband decided he'd had enough fun for the night and was going to go upstairs, take a shower and get ready for bed. After all. This year it was a Thursday and he still had to get up early the next day. My teenage son was out with his friends at a local haunted house and wasn't expected back for another hour or so, so that left me alone on the couch with Chloe. Now just because I don't believe in any of those shows doesn't mean it didn't freak me out a bit, and being alone now watching them I'd have to say I was kind of on edge as it were. And it wasn't long after that I heard the upstairs water for the shower turn on when there became a light knock 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 at the front door. My initial reaction was, what the hell, really? It's almost 10 o'clock, go home. My light's not even on. 
but soon this uneasy feeling came over me. Why the knock? Our doorbell glows in the dark, and without the porch light on, it would be very obvious to anyone standing there that they should just ring the doorbell. I paused. I couldn't really just ignore it. Our front door has a big beveled glass panel, and anybody right at the door could see in enough to see someone in the family room watching TV. It'd be pretty rude for me to just sit there and not answer it. As I was deciding what to do, I heard it again. Knock, 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 coming from that door. I glanced down at Chloe, and she was gone. My gaze followed her usual path to the front door, expecting her to be on her way there as she normally does, but nothing. She wasn't there. I stood up and looked around the room. I found her, crouching by the back door like she was wanting to go out. However, she never asked to go out like that. She always comes and licks my hand or puts her head on my knee. This was totally out of character for her, and I have to say it heightened my anxiety. Chloe, crate, I said. She just turned back and looked at me, like, Hell no, lady. I ain't moving. I yelled up to my husband, but he was already in the shower, and I knew there was no chance of him hearing me. Knock, knock, knock. About that time, a car drove down our street and cast just enough light on the door where I could see the silhouettes of two small children through the glass. Instantly, this gave me a great deal of relief. It was just some kids probably a couple of my neighbors on their way back home that wanted to stop by and show me their costume or something. So I headed to the door. I looked back to make sure Chloe wasn't following me. What a great watchdog, I thought to myself, as she just sat there. I turned on the porch light when I got to the door, and sure enough, I could see through the glass that it was a couple of pretty small kids. A little late for such young ones, I thought, and began to wonder about what kind of parents would let their kids run the streets that late at night. I only opened the door enough to where I could block Chloe's escape if she decided to grow some balls, which was only about two feet. What struck me immediately was how odd these kids were. They weren't wearing any costumes. They were in normal street clothes. Also no customary trick-or-treat either. And I began to feel very uneasy again. It was a girl and a boy. The girl to my left was older, I'd say about 11 or 12. I could tell she was blonde, but I couldn't make out any distinct features, as our lights are from high above, and on columns at the front of the porch, so most of the light was coming from behind them. I hadn't opened the door wide enough for any light from inside to hit them directly. I could tell the boy was younger, and about a foot shorter, I'd say eight or nine, and looked to have had light brown hair. The girl was very polite when she spoke. Ma'am, can we please come inside and use your phone to call our mom? As she spoke, something in the pit of my stomach was telling me that something was very wrong. What kid, even at that age, doesn't have a cell phone of their own these days? I couldn't even remember the last time anybody asked to use my home phone. Uh, hun, don't you have a phone of your own you can call your mom on? This was when things really got weird. Both kids turned to look at one another like they were going to say something, but neither ever spoke. They just stared at each other. Then they both turned back to me and the girl said, Ma'am, my cell phone battery doesn't have any charge left in it. Can we please come inside and call our mother? We're alone out here and my brother's scared. Now I have to admit, there were two competing feelings going on inside of me. The first was that of a mother's heart that wanted to help these two small children get to their mom. The other was this unexplainable sinking fear in my gut that was keeping the other feeling at bay. And it was then that I noticed during the short conversation I'd already opened the door a few extra inches, which I was completely unaware of doing. I stopped. Honey, why don't you give me your mother's number and I can call her myself? There was another pause, and then again they looked at each other in this weird manner. And after a short moment, they turned back to me and the girl said, Ma'am, my little brother has to use your bathroom. Can we please come inside while you call her mom? And with that last statement, the little girl moved closer toward the door, like she was just going to walk on in. As she did, she stepped into the light coming from inside the house, and I got my first real good look at her. Solid, jet black eyes. That's all I could see. 
that motherly instinct was gone and replaced by terror that I don't think I've ever felt in my entire life. I could feel every hair on my arms and back of my neck standing in attention all at once. I closed the door to where my face was just able to stick out. The girl stopped and again pleaded, Please ma'am, we're really scared and alone out here. We have to come inside. Please help us. Then, like on cue, both kids began to whimper and cry. That's when fear took over, and I shut the door and locked it. I'll call your mom if you give me the number, I shouted through the door, but I'm not letting you in my house. I could still see them, stand there on the porch, just staring at me through the beveled glass pane. Part of me wanted to run upstairs to my husband, but the bigger part didn't want to lose track of where they were. That would have freaked me out even more to not know where they were at. After what seemed like forever, but probably only a few seconds, I decided I'd call my neighbor that lives across the street. As I made my way to the side table by our couch to my phone, I glanced at the back door. Chloe was nowhere to be found. We later found her in the guest room under the bed, hiding like she was just as scared as I was. When I got to my phone, I started to look for his contact info. It was only then that the kids stepped away from the door and began to walk down the street. As they did, I walked to the door to get a better look to see where they went, still not calling my neighbor. If you get close enough to the glass, you can see out enough to make the people's shapes out, but you can't see much detail. Of course, standing that close to the door would make you pretty obvious to anyone outside looking in. From the door, I could see that the kids were still standing under the street lamp nearest my house, and they were just staring at me. As I lifted my phone to my ear, trying to call my neighbor, only then did the kids start walking down the street. But before they did, they again looked at each other in that weird manner, like they were communicating without even speaking. I met my neighbor out under the lamp once he was out there, but the kids were nowhere to be seen. Like I said, I don't believe in any of this stuff, and have never even heard about black-eyed kids before talking to my friend. But now I'm starting to doubt if they aren't real. I'm starting to think that some things that you hear about that you just shrug off and tell yourself there's no way in hell that could be a real incident. Maybe they are real. Maybe these things can communicate telepathically. Like those little bastards in Village of the Damned. I don't know what they are. I want to believe that it was just my imagination. But the more I think about it, the more I think that there might be something else out there that I can't explain. It's scary. I have no way of knowing if this was a prank by some punk with colored contacts or if I truly encountered a black-eyed child. But this truly happened to me. The town I went to high school in Temecula, California, is a large suburban area located only a few hours down the freeway from the large California cities like San Diego and Los Angeles. Not a small town, but also not a metropolitan city, just a lot of neighborhoods and shopping centers. I'd been driving for a year or two. I may have even been a senior at the time. On the way home one day, I stopped at CVS. It was just after school so it was still sunny. In fact, it was so sunny out that I raised my hand to shield my eyes as I walked to the car. There were spaces directly in front of the store, and I took one of the first ones. Now remember, I am a small female, and I grew up being wary of being kidnapped. So when I was approached in the parking lot by a young man on a skateboard, I was suspicious. I was a nerdy punk, and didn't know anyone who skateboarded, and I didn't know this guy from school or anything so I thought it was weird that he would even be talking to me at all, especially in a CVS parking lot. So, I come out, and this skateboard kid is just standing by the hood of my car. I drove a beat-up Honda Accord with my first car driving dents and all, so it was super weird when this kid complimented my car. I'll never forget it. He just said, nice car, like he meant it. So, a little flattered, I looked up and into his face to thank him. 
I'll never know if it was just a sunny shadow or if he was a demon. But his eyes, his sockets, the whites of his eyes, everything, were all indescribably black. They were shadowed, but also just black. Black pupils, blacker whites, black sockets. It freaked me out. Looking into his eyes, I couldn't look away. I could see all of him, but all I could look at were his black eyes. I managed a thank you and became flustered as I went to open my car. But he stayed at the hood and offered to wash it for me. He literally said, I could wash it for you. Like what? Why? No, I don't think so. I got in the car anyway and rejected his offers to wash my car. He was starting to creep me out, and he stayed near the hood of the car until I backed out of the space and left the lot. His creepy eyes, his creepy offer, I will just never forget it. I maybe hope that he had dressed his eyes in eyeliner and black contacts, but I'll never know. I only know what I saw, and I saw a kid with black eyes. I've been through a lot of different experiences with the paranormal my whole life, as well as having a shady childhood. My family has always been more religious, mostly Pentecostal. I guess I could say my experiences started when I was about 10 or 11. They started off small. Things moved randomly. A Bible was thrown in the trash, and it was perfectly placed on my dresser. What was weird is that it landed completely face up in the trash, almost like something wanted me to see it. As time went on, these experiences intensified, as did my mom's abusive relationship. The experiences didn't start to really scare me until I'd wake up randomly in the middle of the night with my bed shaking. It all changed one night. I used to sleep with a nightlight on. I was 11 years old. But I also had a TV parallel to my bed. It was a very late night when I saw what would ultimately leave its place in my mind. Through the reflection of the TV, two apparitions were standing at the foot of my bed holding hands. A man and a woman. I was stunned. I stared at them through the reflection of my TV for a good 30 seconds, cowering under my blanket. I unfortunately remember every glaring detail of their figures, but mostly their eyes. Black, lifeless, deep darkness, true evil. As far as clothing, the man was in a full tuxedo, and the lady seemed to be in some sort of nightgown with white lace trim at the bottom. I never told anybody about this until later. Shortly afterwards, my mom's relationship split up due to violence. After that, the man she was with started emailing us scriptures about whores and what happens to sinners. It was weird. As time went on, my experiences with the paranormal only got worse, until eventually ceasing altogether. The reason I'm writing this post is because last night I saw a similar figure in my dream. It was a female, black eyes. No soul. Pale skin. She saw me and started crying hysterically, saying things like, I found you. I miss you. Follow me. She was trying to convince me into killing myself in my dream. Then she proceeded to jump off a cliff, then immediately showed up behind me, hugging me, saying, I can't die. We can finally be together. It was so strange. In this dream, it's like I felt that I knew her. I was crying with her. Now I'll say this. I'm currently engaged and happy and have two dogs. I spoke to her and said, I have a family now. I can't. Like I had some kind of memory of her, I guess. Finally, I proceeded to lay my hands on her pale face. I stated, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. And her face... Her face just melted into black sludge. Then I woke up. This is the second occurrence of these things that I've experienced.